Hi everyone, welcome back. I um I wanted to um I wanted to welcome today. We're going to talk about property data, and I'm not sure if you guys can see my screen actually. And I, I hesitate to make a joke about yeah. me not being able to show my screen. You can see it. You can see it. Yep. Okay. Cool. Because I was just joking with some of these some of these guys about not being able to show their cameras. So welcome back um, to this session. We're talking about property data and how that affects the revenue man uh, revenue management discipline. Um, I want to welcome Ian Auckland from Booking.com and Shaw Miller, who is the president at um, Point Central, which is also a subsidiary of Alarm.com, and, and Jeremy Gall, who is the founder and CEO of Breezeway, also former. CEO and founder of Flipkey, who sold a TripAdvisor, which will come in handy a little bit later. And then Lino Maldonado, Jeremy and Lino, are neither one are on cameras because we're having some technical difficulty. Um, even though, never mind, I'm going to say that. Um, so Lino is coming in, he was former VP of Wyndham and was there until Vecasa purchased it, but has moved over to the dark side and is the CEO of be home 24 7. so guys welcome thank you so much for for being here today um thank you for having me. Ian, I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about um about the properties about how property data in particular affects how booking.com thinks about the sales funnel so i noticed that you've started um, assigning in fact i'll make you a presenter so you can show that the booking.com started assigning a star rating to some of the vacation rental properties. Um, I was wondering what went into that decision and what kind of property data goes into this star rating. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, so I think maybe to, to tackle the first piece of that about what, why, uh, so uh, we introduced quality ratings uh, a year ago, uh, or just just under a year ago, uh, and uh, part of that was, I think, because in terms of providing consistency to uh, the guest and the user of Booking.com, um, we we wanted to really look at how how are we able to showcase uh, short-term rental-style properties. Uh, when, again, they are mixed into a platform that also has uh, hotel-style accommodation on them. Uh, so part of that for us was to think about, let's think about this as a number one. What's, where, where is the real need for guests to be able to be able to contrast and compare uh, with the right style of, uh, of information from there? How does that provide a better uh, experience for the guests? Um, also, how are we able to showcase short-term rentals to people who might not be thinking about short-term rentals, right? So uh, those people who are used to uh, selecting four stars or five stars in a, in a filter, um, how are we able to now surface uh, the, the short-term rental style accommodation? Um, and then make sure that people, you know, who might not have been considering it, because one of the things we knew at least pre-pandemic was uh, people come to the platform, but they don't necessarily have a preference for accommodation type. So how are we able to showcase those kind of accommodations uh, when people might be using, again, filter options as an example? So the, the quality rating for those who aren't familiar, it's sort of a star-like classification, um, but it's actually very localized. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, based on um, factors including uh, localized facilities, uh, size, location, service. So when I talk about localized facilities, it's more about sort of relevance and, and uh, if you like, a sort of comparison of property characteristics of other properties in a similar area. Uh, as an example, something like air conditioning in Miami uh, might be very important, uh, might not be quite so important when you come to properties in, say, Northern Europe. So it comes down to a localized relevance of facility. Um, and so part of that really looks at what are the property characteristics? Uh, and then what are the property characteristics in 
other like properties in that location? And then how can we kind of surface to pull through a quality rating from there? Um, what it's not, and let's be super clear on this, this is not a drive to say everybody should be aiming for five of these squares on the front end of booking, right? It's about, it's about trying to match the right style of expectation to what the guest, so the guest can make an informed decision. Um, and therefore, from a property manager perspective, uh, it's really about the property manager looking to understand, you know, is this realistic? And if they think it's not realistic, how do they fix that in terms of normally letting us know around about the facilities that are offered? It does come into content, heavily into content, because it's obviously based off facilities. Um, and therefore, if we don't have all the details of the content in there, uh, it can impact the score at that point. Um, but part of that will really be looking at making sure that we have all of the content that we need to showcase it, and then the score will generate itself from that. Yeah, that makes total sense in the sense that, like, in a lot of what we've been talking about, it, one, we just had a whole um, session on segmenting properties and building comp sets. And, you know, building comp sets, too, these are all factors in the hotel industry that weigh into their ability to, to identify comp sets. And you are trying to build accuracy and, you know, meet guest expectations, not over exceed them so that they're disappointed. But at the same time, you want to make sure that your property is adequately displayed to the guests for the, having the value that it does have too. Jeremy, you worked in reviews for a long time with Flipkey. Um, in terms of how revenue managers might be thinking of working with the kind of data that's coming through systems like Point Central, like Behome, like um, Breezeway, how important are these reviews in getting the rankings in these platforms like Booking.com and Airbnb and Verbo and, and just merchandising the property? Yeah, I mean, I think the reviews are, they've, they've been a key. Uh, I think Booking is, is doing a great job with this quality score and thinking about how you can compare these properties on a ranking. But for the most part, you know, reviews have been the one thing that we've been able to lean on, and that's been the real quality control, the most impactful way for a platform to get the sense of quality and professionalism is through those reviews on a, you know, on a reactive basis. Um, and I think it's still there and it's going to be there for a while as we think about like how do the channels think about the attributes of the property and importantly, it's not just the property, right? It's, it's, who is managing this property and how is it being managed? And then how does that translate down into the professionalism of the experience that you can expect to have as a, as a guest when you get there? Reviews have been that proxy we've leaned on for a while, but I think you know, this is an indication what we were just hearing from Ian, right? That's an indication of sort of a little bit of a shift in the importance of reviews more towards this more qualitative information about the property and the manager, the experience that you can expect separate from those reviews. When we're talking to some revenue managers um, tomorrow, they were talking about the difference between the hotel industry and the vacation rental industry is that if you've got a courtyard Marriott, that if there's a, if they get one bad review, it doesn't tank their ranking in the, in the system. However, if a one bad review for a villa on booking.com could really hurt them in sort. Is that accurate, Ian? Uh, not, not particularly. I think it depends on the review count uh, and therefore the ultimate review score that comes from there. Um, I will say that I think both of these things need to live hand in hand, right? So the quality rating is one thing and the review score is another. Um, and I think if we come on to kind of pricing style discussions, I, I, I think there's there's different tactics that are used uh, for where a property is and its life cycle uh, with Booking.com, uh, because having a base of reviews is important. Um, again, I think you talk about one negative review in the courtyard by Marriott, based on review density, probably wouldn't in fact wouldn't impact that overall review score 
so it depends on how many reviews that property has, right? And it depends on building that flywheel uh, that a, a short-term rental would have uh, to be able to uh, increase their review count. Um, and so uh, one thing I will also say, side note, if you do get a bad review, respond to it because the responses to it that people have put, people put on there tends to build more trust as well. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think it means that it suddenly tanks in the ranking. It, it it could it could impact the review score depending on the density and the review count that exists against that property. Um, as far as like looking at the data, the one of the things we saw. Well, let me go back. Looking at some of these smart home systems, anyway, Sean, I'm going to go with you because you and I have had some one-on-one -on -one conversations over the years about APIs and um. And kind of the, the data that's coming through what we've seen now is that there's some pricing data that's not flowing through to these um these systems very well including things like amenities um may, like for an example one might say one feature might be internet and another might another system might call it wi-fi or there might be two check boxes for this for amenities where are we in terms of the APIs being able to pass through data between property data that's coming from um, Point Central all the way to attributes that could be communicated on the OTA? Yeah, um, so I think there's two answers to your question. I mean, first is, where are we with just development of APIs that can gather and share data? And I think generally speaking, um, APIs aren't brand new, um, so they're available. The questions tend to function around who should build those APIs, right? And who maintains them? And the reality is there's cost to build and maintain them. And, and so there's, I think, an evolving discussion around how the economics of those API developments and maintenance happens. Uh, but then where does that data go? You specifically asked about like what gets shown on a website. Um, I'm probably not uh, steering Ian way too off here, but I, I think everyone's hope is one day, you know, the systems know who you are and show you the, the data points that are relevant to you uh, and maybe not relevant to someone else. Like that, that's ideal world where all the data is sort of there and you can just pick and choose what's needed based on which customer you're talking to. Um, thinking through the kind of data that's collected in Point Central, just throughout for a home, how can that home help merchandise the property or help sell the property? I'm sorry, how can that data help sell the property? Uh, sell it like a rental, right? So, um, I, I mean, last year alone, we collected over 100 billion data points. So what we try and do is not necessarily data dump all those to people, but realize what's the useful information you have and, and then deliver that. So in the case of vacation rentals, some of the things that we think is really important is it, it isn't displayed today, but could be is, is cleaning status. And Jeremy probably has thoughts on this too, right? But Based on the locks, we know who entered, when they entered, when they left. We know when the guests left. We know when the inspector. So you can start to think of commitments, um, ways to show guests that you are cleaning these properties and spending the right amount of times and the right processes cleaning properties uh, in a way that would be useful to them. Yeah, Jeremy, I mean, that's a good segue into the kind of property care data. So it's like the kind of you and I have also had some conversations about the data that you're collecting, and there are. There are lots of opportunities here, even data back in terms of sending reviews back to the homeowner to or to the property manager and homeowner about when maybe a mattress needs to be replaced or, or when there's a complaint. Like if there's a bad review on booking.com about a sofa, could that information pass all the way back through if we had these kind of things? But I know that's kind of broad, but I mean, really, like, what kind of data are you collecting that would be helpful in the marketing and merchandising of these properties? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't think that's broad. I think that's on target. We used to see that at, at FlipKey, unintended consequence of collecting a lot of guest reviews is really good, powerful material that you can use to force on, you know, to encourage owners to upgrade because it's not coming from you. It's coming from the guests and from the reviews. But I think what's interesting is, you know, we think about property attributes and our mind immediately goes to, you know, we gravitate to pools and hot tubs and bed and bath configurations. Like that's what we think about when we think about property attributes. Um, I think that's changing. And again, I think the property attribute is turning into 
how well is this property maintained? What's the history of responsible management and maintenance of this property? And how do I pass that up to the channel? And who is actually managing it? I mean, wow, it sounds sounds revolutionary, but I think that's like that's the property attribute that makes a really big difference. And I think that's where we're going to start to see more and more focus beyond. Of course, the amenities, the pools, the hot tubs, that makes a difference. But it's how you are thinking about the rest of the property attributes. And then to your point, Amy, you know, it's how's the owner responding and interacting with this property? Are they the type of owner that is receptive to upgrades or are you dragging them across the line to get a new sofa? And what's the level of finishes? That's the sort of stuff that like, if I'm booking, that's what I'm thinking about, which is great, I've got these reviews. I've you know struggled with structured data around pools and hot tubs and saunas and jacuzzis for dozens of years, and that's not gonna go away. Some of that data is messy. But now help me understand like, what's the level of finish in this home? And how's it being maintained so I can really capture that and match expectations with the guest? And price and price, right? And 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 to the point of what we're all focused on, like then how do I price that effectively? Either on booking or within my portfolio. If I'm a manager and I'm I'm an enterprise manager and I have hundreds of units, three quarters of the battle is how do you price within your own inventory? Maybe Amy, I can just add to that because uh, I think Jeremy makes a really valid point here, and I think I, if you saw me, I had a smile when when he started talking about some of the amenities because I think it's a trap that we fall into. Uh, like the, the amenities that Jeremy spoke about were big ticket item amenities, and the fact is that properties need to go very granular in in amenities and and also you know in in, in cleanliness. I think with with COVID. Uh, we and also have done this via an API, but we've introduced uh, the cleanliness um, uh, statements where, where uh, properties can attest to things that they do. But it's not just about that for me, but it's about you know the big ticket items of, of a pool and, and number of bathrooms. Uh, I think you'll see on the screen we, we go right down to shower cap. Right? I think I think it's about how granular you go. And when it comes into the pricing piece, uh, I was thinking about this last week. Like, would you, would you buy, would you pay a premium for a car if the car was described as having four wheels, uh, four doors, and a hood? Right? No, because but those are those are the big ticket items you would expect. You need to get granular in terms of saying what it is you're offering, uh, because that's exactly what hotels are doing. How, how is that done? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, if I can add one thing that uh, between yeah. Ian and, and Jeremy's point, I mentioned the data we, we combined. So one of the things I think that would be impactful when you think about reviews is how to use the data in a smart home to never get the bad review, right? So we've been spending a lot of time to think of how do you shift right. maintenance from reactive to proactive. So, um, you know, can you, you mentioned the couch, right? Uh, can Jeremy catch that and flash the points review? But in our case, we thought about can you make sure the spa and pool are heated when sh someone shows up? Can you make sure the guest doesn't show up to a home that's freezing or too hot? Uh, water sensors that can catch leaks before you have a guest leaving a review about uh, now having an indoor pool that they didn't expect. Uh, the HVAC system can detect problems, right? So like, that's where I think the power of some of this is behind the scenes is all these data points that are being collected and pushed to the property manager so they can proactively take care of problems so the guest never sees what's the normal wear and tear of a vacation rental, right? That it has to be there, but it's just trying to make it more efficient for them. Yeah, Lena, I was going to ask you too, you've been on both sides of this. You're, you're now working with B-Home. I know you've been close with them for a while, but you were at Wyndham for, well, you've been in the property management since you were 16. I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, very, very close <laughs> to that. No, about, about 25 years or so. And, and I think the guys all hit on very, very important points. I think uh, all of the data is great, but if it's not helping you to be proactive and you still are stuck in the reactive mode, then you're not getting the full, you know, benefit of, of the information collected. And and that's where, you know, I spent about nine years as one of the largest clients for Behome uh, working on, from an operator's perspective, we've got two sort of audiences, right? We've got the guest who really wants relevant data. Uh, they want to make a, a very sound purchase 
Um, and they are always, I think, going to use peer-to-peer -peer commentary to feel comfortable about making that purchase. From a proactive perspective, with owners and business development, gathering more owners uh, to your program, that's where this rich content of granular detail, uh, even down to um, a particular building, what, uh, what water heater seems to have the longest life expectancy, that sort of thing can really help owners be more proactive in the routine maintenance and upkeep of the quality of their property that they can then turn around and sell to, you know, to the guests. Uh, so it all matters, you know, and packaging it together, uh, I think is, uh, you know, is really where the focus needs to be going forward. I mean, it'd be great to have like a property scorecard, you know, which I'm sure exists, but it's something that a property manager could give to a homeowner and say, here's your, you know, here's what needs to be done. Um, based on things like reviews from booking.com, you know. Um, I, I want to talk about messaging for a minute. There seems to be a lot of development, um, both with um, BeHome and from um, Breezeway on, you know, some of these messaging apps, or maybe app isn't the right word, functionality. And now that with COVID, I think we've seen a huge demand, I can't imagine, where you are point central in sales right now, but like there's a huge demand and on and going straight to the property. So properties that did not have keyless locks before are getting keyless locks, I'm sure by the thousands. Um, but there needs to be some messaging that's pretty clear to the guests around that. And I was wondering how, um, let's say this the right way, how can messaging improve reviews? How can people like being proactive? Can you get some of that stuff before they actually post it on booking? I mean, Jeremy, I'll start with you on that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a hundred percent, and I'm sure Lino can speak to this as well, both, you know, from, from both sides of the table um, and particularly from the Wyndham side, but, you know, by proactively messaging and interacting and by messaging we mean right you're you're able to um you're able to automate a personalized interaction through sms or other messaging with the guest in a timely fashion right when they've arrived at the property or right before the booking and you're engaging them in this lightweight but inviting touch and you're really being able to you're, you're encouraging any sort of feedback to get in front of those issues right away. It's not going to stop everything, but it does demonstrate how proactive you can you can be. You know, the Wi-Fi goes down or there's an issue, there's a leak. You're on top of it. They're able to text. You're able to text them back. You're able to deliver that sort of Uber like experience where they're getting messages that are indicating when the service provider is coming out to disrupt their vacation, but to fix their problem. Like that is just, that takes what was a bad experience and turns it into being as delightful as you possibly can. Uh, but you're really indicating that you care and you're paying attention, you're, you're paying attention. There's no question that translates back. There's no question that translates back into the reviews, but it also translates back into in the long term, how you think about revenue associated with that reservation. Like messaging is not just, uh, in my opinion, to think about how to um, communicate now. It's a vehicle to start to think about how do you build more revenue, service revenue, on top of that existing reservation. And then you can get really smart about how you build that into your whole um, revenue management model as, as a manager. Um, Lena, I wanted to see if you wanted to add to that, but also um, from your experience on both sides as a property manager going to be home, what really surprised you as far as what functionality there is, what like where we are headed in the future now that you're on the tech side of this? Yeah, so 100%, you know, agree with uh, Jeremy there. I think guest experience is uh, is something that I spent a lot of time on both sides, you know, focusing on and being intuitive instead of reactive, right? So when you think about a guest journey from the search on, you know, booking.com or other channels all the way through the purchase, um, we as operators sometimes get very excited about the purchase and then really forget about everything until arrival. 
uh, and with the communication modules that we now have in the in the tech side, you can you can keep the excitement and high energy from a consumer's perspective, you know, at, at very high levels, just by simple outreaches that now can be automated. Um, so a, a guest experience can absolutely translate into great reviews, even if things didn't go exceptionally well the the entire time because you've built trust right um so i i think it's a it's a very critical piece uh, to consider going forward in your business but having somebody sitting at behind a desk and 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 you know emailing out you know confirmation statements and all that kind of stuff that that was over 10 years ago i hope in most uh, in most businesses because uh, the tech is 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 ready and able to deliver very high quality marketing pieces, outreach pieces, and and things like even the review itself. Um, a lot of companies, and I, I'm actually going on a another trip uh, here in a couple of weeks, and and the company I, I booked through uh, doesn't have a lot of automation. They don't they they didn't really sync up. Uh, information delivery you know very well it's a beautiful cabin and a nice location uh, but they are not communicating with me relevant information at the right time in my journey right uh, the first thing you get is an invoice well that's not very exciting you know for someone planning a vacation um, i'd like to hear more about the area things i shouldn't you know miss uh, maybe even the opportunity to 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 you know um, check right into the property itself. Um, bill my credit card, but don't make that your marketing piece. You know, uh, the other thing is when you ask somebody for a review itself. I spent a lot of time with my operators talking through this particular piece of the journey because you know a lot of times we'd wait a day or two days post departure to ask for the review. Um, versus reaching out the day after arrival, just checking in to make sure everything's fine. That tends to have a, a higher impact on overall scoring when they know you care and that you're there for them for the quality of their stay. The other thing we didn't do particularly well uh, early on is that you know we we get these four and five star reviews, and from an NPS perspective, those are your your eight nines and tens, and so they're telling you yes, they would tell friends and family about your great you know, uh, vacation experience, but we never asked them to. you know. So I think there's opportunity with the communication side to, to uh, not only collect that data, but put it to work for you as well. We, um, we actually talked about NPS a little bit this morning, which is Net Promoter Score. Actually, um, Lena, can you expand a little bit? A lot of the in, um, independent managers haven't used Net Promoter Score in the same way that the larger multi-market companies are. What is um what is it used for when you're at Wyndham? Why did you use it, and how did it help? Yeah, so there's really two sides to the NPS or Net Net Promoter Score. Um, it's really for a large publicly traded company. It's a very quick and dirty litmus test on how engaged your customer are, your, your customers are, or or how um, satisfied they are with your overall service. And I I say that in air quotes that you couldn't see, but um, you know, it's a it's something to celebrate or to not very quickly, uh, but it only tells a little piece of the story, right? Because operationally, I don't need to know just whether or not they would share their experience with friends and family. I need to know did everything in the property work? You know, how was the reservations process? How was the you know the quality of the property? You know, the 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 entire rest of the story. So I don't really get that hung up on NPS. It's just a quick view. There's there's a dozen other KPIs underneath that that, that are more critical, I think. And and customers today are, are willing to tell the story um, in their own words and share that detail. So if you're asking them only for the NPS, but they're telling the world a review on booking.com that was one star, you know, you, you kind of miss the opportunity, right? It totally makes sense. Um, Jeremy, on the, the data side of this, as far as as you've been looking and building through Breezeway, what opportunities do you see from all the data points that you're acquiring in these work orders and, and service um, appointments calls? I think there's an opportunity that there's 
there's a lot. I think there's a lot there. That's a that's a, a good open question. But I think it's um, you know some of it ties back to some of the work we do with folks like Sean Miller and Point Central. You can tie data from those work orders into the locks. You can get quicker and more efficient about your checkout process. Um, you can start to see trends in that data about you know what you can really get much more granular about um, time to task and how much work you can really take on. How much work can you then start to offer for people to come in for an early check-in or a late checkout and really optimize that? That's again optimizing more of that service revenue. But you know, we spend a lot of time here, a lot of airtime on reviews. That's a nice, that's a nice thing. You've showed up in market, you want to get into the property early. I'm sure you can you can charge for it as a manager, but there's real value and enjoyment to that guest getting into the property early rather than waiting around. Um, and so all of that stuff from the work order management. And then I think um, we touched on this earlier, but I think we're at the beginning of when I talk about property attributes, thinking about safety in a way that's broader than just COVID. And I think we're going to see over the next few years a real trend in focusing on how these properties are maintained and using the work order history and how that property is cared for um, as real data that folks like Booking are going to want to dig into to say, hey, wait a second, like what is happening here at this property? How safe is this property? And do I want to, like, is this suitable for our platform? I need to get a handle on the quality and the responsibility of all these of all these listings. And the work orders and how you interact with the properties, and, and it's the best way to understand that. Yeah, I know things are changing at booking.com. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing, I mean, it's not, it's not small news that there have been a lot of layoffs there and some more to come. Um, I know that's not easy for some of the people on your team that we're friends with on LinkedIn and stuff. Um, as in a post-COVID environment, what you're seeing from consumer behavior, what do you think is the future of travel? I mean, and that I've got you here. Um, when you think about what, how people are booking and what we're, how, what kind of recovery we're seeing, how are you guys thinking about? Um, whether or not consumer behavior has changed permanently, if this is a, or just in the future in general. Yeah, it's probably it's probably too soon to say permanent. I think uh, I think many of us are uh, reacting to what we know. Um, so you know, if there's if there's two things I can say to you right now, um, and the biggest thing to really think about, uh, flexibility is the first one, uh, and and. Uh, mobile i think would be the second and and uh, i'll come on to that one in a minute but i think flexibility right now and i don't know whether this is going to go away right i think that again people want freedom and they want the flexibility and part of that question is you know, if you're showcasing your property with say a 30-day cancellation penalty uh, versus a resort up the street with you know apartments with kitchens and they're at 24 hours uh, people need a little bit more of that reassurance and that flexibility right now I'm not sure that's going to change uh, certainly not for a while I think uh, I think people you know, people people aren't ready to fully commit and they want to know that they've got they've got uh, the ability to change their plans if they need to mobiles are really one for us though I think maybe this is just a, a, a current trend so I mean for years for the last few years we've said uh, you know more than 50% of our business is done on mobile and I think you know that's that's up to and as high as 80% on certain days right now right so um, when you talk about how do you get noticed through these facilities and through these reviews and through these quality ratings there's another add-on consideration which is am i also getting noticed on mobile platforms right so um part of that is to think about and this is specifically around pricing do i have a specific mobile rate um so one of the things that we see is the properties that have a specific mobile rate on average also see the conversion increase by 26 percent um 
So knowing that you put all of those data points together and you can see that, uh, again, not every day, but certain days we're up to 80% mobile. Uh, those partners who have a mobile rate are converting better. So also layer on your pricing decisions around that. I mean, I think it's way too early for me to talk about what the future holds, right? But I think that this is what the now holds. And this is something that I think that people haven't yet adjusted their pricing uh, strategies towards. Um, Sean, and looking how COVID has changed um, the, the desire for people to want to go directly to the unit. And I think more of a, it appears, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but is there more of a desire for the property manager now to not have an, an office check-in now than there was before COVID? Yeah, I, I mean, Amy, there was people, right, who had keyless locks, but still uh, wanted or required office check-ins. Uh, and usually that was for one of two reasons. One was they felt that check-in was core to sort of their value proposition, right? Greeting that guest and welcoming them. Uh, in the current times with social distancing and people's comfort levels that they've had to rethink that, which uh, I think is good, right? They've thought about how do they just know their guests and find other ways to show their uniqueness so that they can check the guests direct into the home. The other challenge was probably more operational, right? Especially if you're in a community with uh, an intercom system, uh, how do you get them in? Uh, you, they usually need to come by and get a card or a fob or something so they could scan themselves in or buzz themselves in. Um, We've heard that for a while. We tried to solve that a couple months ago. We went out and acquired a connected intercom company. So now a guest in the community with us like gets one code that sort of gets them through all those doors uh, that they need. So at least we remove the operational bottleneck so that the operator can serve guests the way they they need to today. But it's definitely uh, it, percentage wise, I haven't pulled it in like a month or so, Amy, but uh, earlier last quarter, I mean, that service has been up uh, triple digits of just like watching how people go direct to home. What other, what all besides your pool and your hot tub, can you control through the smart home system? <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time for that. Um, <laughs> Every, right? I mean, is that uh, where we are now? If there's power to it, uh, we can have some function of control. I, let me answer it by saying, what are the most common things people control? Front entryways, patio doors, pools, spas, lighting, um, thermostats. Those types of those types of things tend to be your most common, and then uh, we've also had people start to roll out security systems on top of ours, so that if you have a season a house in a area that has a very pronounced down season, you want to protect it. Like those types of things, people have started to add on just to make sure the home's secure. So one of the things that we've been hearing, we have some hoteliers on this call and some hotel tech people in here as well, that. There, there, there's a common assumption that vacation rentals are, you know, 20 years behind hotels. You hear things like that all the time. Um, as far as this type of capability of putting people directly into a property as quickly as possible, that may not be true. Um, Lena, do you think we're behind hotels in um, in smart no. are you in its ability to do on site check-in, or maybe we're ahead? Not, not at all. I don't think we're behind at all. I think in, in some cases, we're actually pushing the technology. Um, our platform uh, actually translates hospitality uh, very well to timeshare, to hotel, and in other forms of, of uh, you know, lodging. So uh, we're seeing other verticals that are way behind vacation rentals. Um, you know, uh, to Sean's point about you know connected devices, we're able if it's a if it's a smart connected device with an open API, we can control it and centralize it into a single user interface and automate its function. So um, hotels are way behind that. Now they have um, uh, pretty slick uh, you know um, concierge applications on you know some of these uh you know phones i've seen uh, they've got bluetooth connectivity to unlock the front door uh in some cases you're still seeing ipads to control tvs and curtains and, and that sort of thing and that and that's really about as far as they they've gotten um as you know wyndham has i think 7400 hotels in their division i think 22 or 23 different brands um, there are only a few of those brands that actually have any sort of smart connectivity at all. Um, so I think the you know that we are in many cases uh, ahead of the uh, chain type hotels. Probably not so much in some of the private or independent you know resort style you know uh, 
facilities. There's there's some tech there, um, but I think I think we are leading leading the charge in in uh, you know from a short term rental perspective. If I'm a homeowner and I'm trying to manage my, I mean, I've got these these smart home are powered, I guess, different things. I've got a property manager and I want to switch property managers. Um, does all of that stuff stay with them? Is there do I don't I don't really know how this works. Do they buy it from the property manager or is there some Sean, how is that working right now that you're seeing? I was wondering who's gonna get that question, Lena or I. Um <laughs> I think it's very it's very dependent on every property manager, right? Uh, Amy, we've seen some situations where the property manager asks the owner to buy all the hardware outright, uh, and then just, you know, they figure out how to pay for any recurring costs. Some property manager I've seen fund uh, the hardware uh, is a way to retain owners or incent owners. Um, so it can work in either situation, right? Just economics aside, um, the devices, I believe Lena will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the devices, Be Home uses and ours, all uses this uh, technology called Z-Wave. So you can sort of like move homes, a property manager can take over another uh, owner's home. And if there's Z-Wave devices in there, essentially put in the hub for whatever software they use, whatever automation software they use and sort of control those devices. Uh, if a homeowner switched their home, say from property manager A to property manager B, and they both happen to be using the same software, then behind the scenes that home can just sort of migrate over. So it does support, um, the natural transactions that happen in everyday vacation rental management. Yeah, Sean, I, I would just add add to that. First of all, it, it is different by uh, property manager um, in how they want to structure, you know, their business. But uh, uh, our platform is completely device agnostic, so we we communicate on Zigbee, Z-Wave, 802, cell, you know, Wi-Fi, and and the nine and the whole nine yards, which makes mobility very easy to swap you know, uh, from one property, you know, to the next. And uh, I don't see that changing in this space. Uh, the, the one thing in the short-term rental business that you can guarantee is that you're going to swap units with your neighbors and you're going to swap some employees with your neighbors on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, I think our platforms make it easy to, to do that and accommodate that. Amy's back. Amy, we thought back. we lost it for a second. We thought we lost I it know, for a second. I know. The whole answer. <laughs> all, I, all I know is I was like, thank God this is the most qualified panel that I can actually ask relevant <laughs> questions. So. But she's back, so phew. No well, pressure human. for me. <laughs> I wanted to know the answer. I know I'll have to go back and watch the video. <laughs> okay, real quickly, lighting around. Um, COVID, what changed the most in vacation rentals after COVID? I'm going to start with Lino since he's the first one to not get his camera on. What changed the most in COVID is uh, the governor shutting down short-term rentals in Florida. <laughs> you know, I think uh, I think uh, a lot of these companies, and I'm Sean, I think it was you that made the point about, um, you know, the uh, the rental operators and how they're changing their mindset now and what they really need in terms of direct check-in versus, you know, a, a um, you know, a, a walk-up uh, process is that I think they've learned that they don't have to be um, in that, uh, you know, process anymore. Um, and sometimes you learn that stuff painfully. Sometimes that is what drives innovation. I think uh, the tech companies on this call for sure are very uniquely positioned to respond to the changes in the industry that we saw coming eight or 10 years ago. It's just convincing operators that that guests really, really don't want a check-in process. They really just want to start their vacation. And in getting them in early by starting the housekeeping workflow, you know, the night before so that, so that uh, you know, they can get in the unit at 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning versus you know, sitting outside with a with a SUV full of groceries and ice cream that they come in yelling about, you know, at four o'clock at four o one, you know, that that doesn't have to happen anymore. And uh, and so I think from a COVID perspective, it just opened the eyes, I think, to operators on what the customers are really looking for today and what they really need to do operationally versus what they thought. Sorry, Amy, I didn't hear you there. Amy, you're muted. Oh. 
I've been back. telling other people all day long. You've been giving and everybody a hard time on this one. No, no, it's coming back. It's karma. <laughs> Jeremy, same question to you. What has changed the most since COVID and vacation rentals? I think it's responsibility. You know, I think this is the beginning of the end uh, of the amateur vacation rental and um, a really big focus on, you know, the amateur that doesn't want to be a hospitality provider. I think this is it. Like this is now the new normal is a level of responsibility to say, hey, look, this is a real hospitality category that we have to take seriously. Um, I, I think the translation of the focus on cleaning is going to bear out into like these, this needs to be done correctly. And we've got a responsibility um, that the whole industry has to hold itself up to. And, you know, what Lena was talking about, what happened in Florida, right, is, you know, when it comes to, we can separate property managers and enterprise managers from individual owners and accidental hosts all we want uh but the state of florida is not going to separate them they're going to lump them together um mm -hmm. and you're going to have to it's time to rise up i think and really think about professionalism here and how that carries forward um sean same thing super brief we're gonna have to run super brief okay uh, i don't disagree with anything said before this i would say uh what it, we've seen is it is uh, this has helped operators evolve their conversation about technology and why they need it, uh, especially when they need owner's involvement. So in the case of smart home, right, how do you pay for it? Um, operators know their benefits, but showing owners like the ongoing costs or emphasizing the ongoing costs they save or even the data out there on what value it adds to the home in case this owner is thinking, you know, within some reasonable time period, they're going to sell the home and how this investment not only helps them manage your vacation rental better today and protect it, but be ready for when they sell it in the future. We've just seen a, a shift from, hey, this would be nice to have, to we need these types of technology tools to really run the vacation rental properly today. And sorry about the music. All of a sudden, my entire um, audio just came on. That's Sean, okay. I think you talked to my smart home. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um. Again, I also don't disagree with what's previously been said. I would say one thing, though, from 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 our perspective, at least, uh, it's demand. Uh, that's what's changed, right? It's up, down. It's local. It's international. It's all over the place right now. So, uh, being able to react to it very quickly, uh, and therefore thinking about how can you run when you run your business, be very smart in noticing immediate trends. I mentioned flexibility. I mentioned mobile but being able to just quickly switch around what you're doing to react to what is happening on the ground in, a, in, in demand terms. It's no- You guys, thank you so I much for being- yeah, Thank you for being patient and dealing with all this hurricane stuff. And um, I, I'm grateful to you. I will get these videos up quickly and we've got about 10 minutes before our next session, looking at the winter 2021 outlook in the ski markets. Thanks, you guys, so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Thank you.